What's going on, podcasting world? It's another episode of Core Consult's RX Podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me, as always, Cole Swanson. Cole, what's up, man? Nothing much. It's good to be back. I know. It's been a minute since we recorded now. Yeah, we didn't make the week mark on this one. No, we sure didn't. I think it's been eight days. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt our numbers. Ah, it's going to kill us. Is, I, I blame you. It's crushing. It's all my fault. <laughs> Tag them work. We should, we should totally record at 10 o'clock, then we could do it. <sighs> You know, I was thinking maybe we, I'm could sorry, record, guys. we could record in the morning sometime. I guess it's not Oof. totally illegal. Yeah, it's illegal. <laughs> okay. I don't like to record it's, in the morning. It's totally off limits. I don't know a lot of stuff anyway, <laughs> so I really don't know before, a lot of stuff in before the Before RX Coffee, then it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, shout out to RX Coffee. <laughs> if you guys haven't tried it, it's delicious. You should totally check it out. It's really good. They're not even a sponsor of us. I'm just a huge <laughs> fan of their coffee. <laughs> it's good coffee. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll admit it if we're not sponsored or if we are sponsored. And we're we're not. We're not okay, we're by just, anybody. We so. just like coffee and we like to have caffeine. But um, and we think it's cool. They called it RX Coffee. Yeah, actually, sure. don't know their story. We should have them on. Yeah, we should. It'd be good. We have no guests today. It's just us. Just us. Feels like the last two months has been guest heavy. So. Guest heavy. And so we thought, you know what? Let's tackle, tackle a topic that we should do with no guest. Like yeah. tuberculosis. <laughs> tuberculosis. A couple of infectious disease, you know, basically specialists, I would say. Basically. Yeah. A non-certified specialist? Mm-hmm. Is that a thing? Here's the thing about certifications. Okay. We're bo- super overrated. We're board certified and uh, our board is right there behind the camera. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, jeez jokes so yeah tuberculosis today uh it'll be a a nice overview but i think we'll hit all the big stuff we'll be focusing more on i guess you know the pulmonary manifestations and not go so much into different um areas that tuberculosis can affect but um yeah we were chatting beforehand about a uh, a bill that that may or may not have been passed in arizona because we didn't read the whole thing but (laughs) no it it passed the house i don't know where it went from there but But headline wise uh, it's very interesting right it is, yeah. So I, t- I saw this on, uh, I think, LinkedIn originally, but it just the title of it was House Panel Approved Bill to Let Pharmacists Write Prescriptions Over Doctors' Objections. And I was like, that's the way to do it. Click. <laughs> so um, That's, that's a per- uh, interprofessional collaboration if I've ever heard it. Honestly, that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. We want to make <laughs> as many physicians mad as possible. No. So not, not at all. But uh, it's kind of interesting because it was done in Arizona. Um, that's where this bill kind of started. So it's a state thing. It's not a national right, thing. Right, right, right. But um, basically, it, it passed with five to four votes. So it, it's something that was a little bit controversial. Um, it was uh, HB 2548 is what they're calling it. So um, if you want to look it up. But basically what the the bullet points are was that it would allow pharmacists to do certain like rapid testing, um, like strep, flu, um, tuberculosis is listed, and basically allow them to start medications if they had a positive test um, for whatever ailment they were looking for. Um, and uh, did I say start test, start prescriptions? No, you said start prescriptions did for I? whatever test that was positive, okay. which we don't know, you know, for sure what all that entails. And we'll talk about why that'd be somewhat concerning for TB. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. So the other part of it too, was it allows a pharmacist to continue a prescription for an additional 30 to 60 days. Um, as long as the prescription is not a controlled substance. Um, the other caveat to that is a pharmacist has to notify the original prescribing physician within 72 hours to let them know they've issued a prescription. So for reference, it's, you know, the, the laws are different throughout every state, but in South Carolina, it had been that you could write a three day, um, script or whatever emergency fill for uh, a patient. And then you'd have to notify the prescriber and just let them know. I think it was in 2017, either 2016 or 2017, they changed it to 10 days. And so now without it being an emergency, we can change it to 10 days as long as we notify the prescriber. And I think in an emergency, if we're like in a state of emergency, which happens like all the time around here, yeah. we're it's not hurricanes. Yeah. I think you can actually do 30. Don't quote me on that. I think, yeah, but I, think I, I right. saw some email about that. Um, so yeah, so in Arizona, they're just saying blanket statement, uh, patients out of lisinopril, they've had a prescription for it, then you can just do 30 to 60 days more as long as you notify the, the physician. And they also don't specify, at least, again, I need to read this before I actually talk about it on a podcast, but too late. Um, the They're also making it sound like it's all pharmacists. So in a retail setting, you know, that's so what Cole and I were talking about before we stopped our conversation because we figured we should probably put this on a recording. Um you know, th- there's a lot of issues with 
the setting in which this would be taking place. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, as a pharmacist, obviously I want to be on team pharmacy, but, um, I also work with a lot of physicians and PAs and nurse practitioners and, um, in a very different setting than a retail setting. And so I can kind of see where some of the concerns that were brought up at the, at the meeting. Um, so, you know, and I'll kind of read through this real quick, but, um, one of the physicians, um, was saying that, you know, talking about the uh, 30 to 60 days, she, uh, the physician said that she was concerned that a pharmacist could restart a medication she intentionally stopped uh, and she would not be notified for as many as three days. So, you know, that's definitely, I, I feel like, a valid concern in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, like Cole brought up before we started recording, he brought up, okay, well, you're on lisinopril. She starts them on a low dose and let's say she gives them two weeks, 30 days, whatever it may be, uh, the patient doesn't want to go for their follow-up appointment to have their, you know, renal fun- their uh, serum creatinine checked or their uh, potassium checked or anything like that. And now the patient comes to you as in the pharmacy and, you know, especially in a, in a community setting, not talking on community pharmacists at all. I was one for a while. Um, but, you know, you don't have access to labs or, or ability to draw labs for the most part. And so they come to you, you write this prescription to follow up and, you know, you end up having a acute renal uh, injury or something because the, the prescriber wanted to follow up with labs and, and maybe bump the dose up and all that. So uh, her, her point was that it can, can definitely hurt collaboration with doctors and um, create, as she put it, silos in which each will begin to ind- independently operate instead of communicating about the patient. So yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, there there should be a big distinction between retail setting and clinic setting. Because mm-hmm. I'm all for you know, hey, retail pharmacists, we know a lot, and I don't think our knowledge is always utilized as much as it could be. Right. But that being said, we have limited resources where we are. So in a clinic, that that's great. Hey, I'm, I'm going to re up your, you know, with there's collaborative practice agreements that allow this anyway. But hey, I'm going to re up uh, your your meds, then I'm going to walk over and tell the doc and the doc is going to say, great. Or he's going to say, wait a second, you shouldn't have done that. Why don't you give him a call and we'll make the switch because we're all in the same office. Um, but in retail setting, just like Mike said, yeah, concerns there. So blood pressure is one. Maybe they wanted to have a follow-up appointment to increase the dose, but now the patient's going to go on that lower dose for a long time. Um, or maybe the dose is too high. They want to decrease all that stuff. Um, other things, what does it apply to? Antibiotics. So let's say a patient had seven days worth of Bactrim. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm still not feeling good. Oh, well, here's more Bactrim. And I don't think a pharmacist would do that because yeah. you know, they probably need a different antibiotic. But, you know, at the same time, when things are happening fast, sometimes pharmacists just want to get the patient their prescription and get them, you know, get them out the door, unfortunately, and instead of going through the process of calling the doctor and verifying things and all that stuff. So, yeah, we don't, we're, we're speaking from a totally, uh, uneducated place about this bill too it's just whatever we're seeing on the internet but it's it's very interesting interesting idea but i definitely think they're valid concerns yeah and you know a couple things too kind of points that i would make to the about the prescriber though is you know they they, she says that she doesn't want to hurt collaboration but i would definitely argue that there's a huge lack of respect in a lot of cases not all cases but a lot of cases um, from prescriber side, looking at like a retail pharmacist, they definitely see them as not necessarily right. <laughs> needed in the collaboration of pharmacotherapy planning. Um, so, I, you know, again, that's not a blanket statement. I know several of them that are very uh, willing to talk with a retail pharmacist and collaborate, but um, I definitely uh, can say from my time in retail, I've never, I, I didn't have too many physicians. I had a few, not too many physicians that were like calling me up for like advice. Right. Um, one, because they don't know you and right. you could be anybody. But um, two, I just don't think that that's fully set in. Now, from a clinic standpoint, I 100% would back this up because like if I'm in my clinic, I, I absolutely would feel very comfortable um, adding refills or starting a medication after a test comes back because I have the lab there. Mm-hmm. I can order la- I can order whatever labs I need to follow up. I can make sure that my caseworkers and the front end staff are making sure the person has a, a scheduled follow up appointment. They can see their primary care provider. And, you know, I would feel very comfortable in that setting because I have all my bases covered. And if there was something that I wasn't unsure of or needed help with, I could always go get the, you know, attending physician. So, you know, I think that that, um, yeah, I would be probably against this in a retail setting as much as I want to be on team pharmacy. Um, and the other thing is how in the world would they work that into 
into right. workflow with retail pharmacies are so bad about pushing just these programs on pharmacists, but they're like not willing to give you any extra help. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, speaking from experience, not just talking, but speaking from experience, there's just no, no shot that there's going to be a hundred percent approval, even from pharmacists in this, because they don't want to have to deal with all the paperwork and everything right. else that goes into this, the testing. Cause by the time you get done testing somebody for something like this, cause it's going to have to be you, they're not going to let the technicians do it. Um, you know, you're filling out the prescription stuff. Now you got backed up on everything else and you know, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. So the only way that this would be reasonable is if somehow the pharmacist had in the retail setting had quick access to like a lab, some type of set of labs that you knew that you were doing something in a safe way. That the rapid testing, yeah, the only other way that I could see that working out is if they're talking more like minute clinic wise. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, I don't think they have access to labs or anything. Like minute yeah. clinics, I doubt, are treating, um, you, you know, like blood pressure for long term right. or anything like that. Right. I, I don't know. I've so never yeah, been in one, it, but. it's strange. If, if any of you guys know more about this bill, be cool if you wrote in and were like, hey, you guys are morons. You should have read the bill. Uh, Don't call us morons. It's mean. It hurts our feelings. <laughs> and, you know, tell us why this is good. Because, you know, I, I always want to advocate for pharmacists and uh, further what we are able to do. But I also want what we're able to do to be safe. That being said, a lot of pharmacists had a lot of concerns about immunizations when that first happened. Um, and, you know, it's even though it can get kind of crazy sometimes, I think it's a good and good for the patients to be able to mm. get it in that setting instead of having to make a doctor's appointment. Um, so, yeah interesting thing another uh, another quote from one of the physicians that was on the panel against this bill said that uh you know things like tuberculosis testing can result in a false positive um, which could lead a pharmacist to wrongfully prescribe medications to a patient um, especially children and then um the pharmacist on the other side said that basically those fears were not legitimate and this that and the other yeah um and then you know the Basically, the argument came down to, um, you know, things like the pharmacist doesn't have the same training as a physician, which in a lot of cases is true. Um, and but one of the physicians said that, um, you know, even at the end of medical school, you're not equipped to make a proper diagnosis um, and really and treat the patient. That's why they have intern year and their residencies and all that, which. I can understand the only thing about that that doesn't make any sense is if I'm a PA or a nurse practitioner, then I absolutely could do, could interpret yeah. that, diagnose, all that stuff. And I've had two years of training less than a pharmacist. Yeah. So I know I'm under the quote unquote direct supervision of a physician, but how often is, you know, the, that the physician like in the room with you, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So I, I definitely can see both sides. I would advocate for, like, I personally in a retail setting would never start somebody on tuberculosis medications. <laughs> would be crazy. I mean, I can't check LFTs. There's just so right. many things that I would want to check for. You, you can't do so, HIV yeah, so, testing. So it looks like, um, which, yeah, this is the whole reason we brought this up was because TB was included in this, which was like, you know, I mean, rapid strep tests with moxicillin is one thing. But, right. Um, flu. Flu. Yeah. TB is a totally another thing. That's a different animal. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's very yeah. interesting. I, I would be all for the the rapid strep and, and flu and stuff like that. But yeah, And I was going to say, it, you know, being on the pharmacist side, it's really easy to look at this bill and say, oh, well, this is just pretentious doctors trying to hold pharmacists down and not let them, you know, they want to hold. No, I mean, they have they have valid, very valid concerns. Uh, and I think it's, it's good to look at both sides. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that... Um, I honestly, if nothing else, I think it actually leads on to, you know, more I in, the encouraging more pharmacists to keep up with their clinical knowledge because I feel like that's the way the kind of world is moving anyway. Yeah. As far as pharmacists doing this kind of work, but it'll be in a clinic setting when yeah. the robots take over mm-hmm. retail pharmacy. It's going to move all of us into primary care physicians' offices and things, and you know, I I think that people got to be kind of ready for that and yeah start pre- start thinking that way now. Prepare for the change. Yep. It's coming. It's coming. The robots are taking over. Elon Musk told me. <laughs> all right. So all that aside, now that we talked for 15 minutes about a political bill, which you've never done before. Yeah. Almost almost got political. I don't think we really did, no, though. No. We're just... I feel like we we're very moderate. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty moderate on here. Um, so uh, let's talk tuberculosis. Let's do it. So um, tuberculosis, an infectious bacterial disease. Uh, the bacteria is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, 
obviously. Uh, but it most commonly affects the lungs. That's what we're going to talk about um, for the most part is the pulmonary part of this. Uh, but it can um, spread to other parts of the body, uh, which is kind of how they know that tuberculosis is a really old disease. Um, so for one, it is frequently called or used to be called consumption, especially in Europe. Uh, but it actually is derived from a Greek term. Um, thesis, I think, is actually Hippocrates that um, identified it, and it means wasting away um, or consumption, like the disease is consuming you, because it would describe really any disease that was like a wasting disease. But tuberculosis was so common uh, that it was almost always referred to as this. And in the U.S., it is not very common. But around the world, it's actually pretty common, and rates are increasing. Mm-hmm. So there's two different kinds. Obviously, there's uh, latent TB and then there's active TB. So when we hear latent TB, that basically means that um, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria itself, is living in the lung, but it doesn't. It's not growing. It's not replicating. Um, the person doesn't have any symptoms. They're not contagious. Um, however, it can actually advance to active TB. Um, as far as the, the diagnosis of true active TB, um, they have something called an AFB stain um, that is not necessarily specific, but that kind of shows that there's a mycobacterium species, mm -hmm. which can lead you to kind of looking at some empiric therapy. Specifically acid fast bacilli. Yeah, there you go. Just let me use my abbreviations, okay? Don't try. <laughs> you gotta let everybody know what it means. Look it up. Google it. Yeah, you Google can't expect it. me to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and then you know the patient's gonna have symptoms. So you know whether or not they have chest pain, they could be coughing up blood, um, just painful. You know, breathing. Then you know, chill, shaking, night sweats is a very common one, like mm -hmm. chronic fatigue, weight loss, weight loss. Um, so kind of not necessarily specific, I guess coughing up blood would be a huge concern. Yeah. It, it's actually other than the cough, the, the coughing up blood is, um, probably the, the most iconic sign. The rest of the stuff is very nonspecific. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's usually diagnosed later than it should be because especially in the U S you're not really thinking TB. Uh, when I was on a mission trip in South Africa, uh, one patient that I didn't, you know, have to be face to face with cause I was pharmacy. So I'm in the back, you know, s safe from all the diseases. Whew, uh, close one. Right. <laughs> uh, but one of my friends was seeing this patient and she was working him up for like 15 minutes. And then he was like, Oh yeah. And, um, I was, I have, you know, tuberculosis. Oh, well good man. No mask or nothing. So don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> don't He's need it. He's super good at wiping his mouth. So. <laughs> we're, we're pretty silent. Uh, so yeah, in, in um, in a lot of countries, uh, it, it spread extremely easily uh, through droplets of blood. Um, it can be airborne, um, kind of like the flu. So, yeah, it, it's one of those diseases that can very easily become pandemic. Which is why if you have ever worked in the medical field um, or I think probably even gone to college, then you've probably had a TB test, right? A yes. PPD. I just had one recently. Did you really? Like three days ago. Oh, I can actually. see it on your arm. Yep. So then, yeah, it's actually showed up a little bit, which is so uh, how to go. You know, yeah, not great. <laughs> yeah, I'm on. I'm on medication now. <laughs> yeah. Start on some rifampin. <laughs> so, so isoniazid, it's, actually. So there is uh, rifampin's an option now if I'm resistant to isoniazid. Uh, sure. So um, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Yes. But getting um, ahead of ourselves. There are uh, different, I guess. Um, you know, ways of looking though at the mark. Cause I do have a little bit of a red mark on my hand. I was joking cause the nurse kind of looked at it like, Oh shoot. <laughs> and so I saw her, uh, our, uh, one of our <laughs> medical directors, um, across the way when she was looking at my, I was like, Paul, get over here. <laughs> it's an emergency. <laughs> And so, uh, well, yeah, it was funny, but no, it's good. Bring it's, out um, the isolation chamber. Yeah, right now. Give me a mask. <laughs> Everyone get away from me. I have to go home. <laughs> I have to go home and play Xbox right now. Yeah. So it, there is kind of different specifications as far as the, the results. So if somebody has um, like a greater than or equal to five millimeter in duration, you know, the raising up of the actual mm -hmm. spot, um, you know, it, it would be considered positive if the person has close contacts to recent TB cases. So if mm -hmm. I was dealing with a TB patient, um, or if I had something like HIV or mm -hmm. had a transplant or anything, as far as I know, I don't have any of that stuff. So oh, good. I wouldn't be worried about that. Um, greater than 10 millimeters. Um, then I'm looking at people who are recent immigrants, if you know, from, especially from countries that are more prevalent for a, for TB. 
patients that are IV drug users, um, maybe they had moderate immunosuppression, um, and then, you know, patients that live around or work around someone who uh, could be infected. So like mm-hmm. prisons, obviously healthcare workers, things like that. So And children, children less than four specifically. Yeah. So you know, I would probably fall into that case just because I work around healthcare a lot, obviously. I, I thought think. it was because you were a child. Well, I, I, at heart, depends on if you ask my wife or not. <laughs> um, and then someone who has absolutely no risk factors at all would be greater than or equal to 15 millimeters. So you have to have a big old spot yeah, on so your you, arm. You'd see a big bee sting on there. Uh, yeah. And it's specifically the, the induration or the raising, like Mike said, and not the redness that goes around it. So if you're actually like, oof, this thing is, uh, this is like, you know, pimple on mm-hmm. picture day kind of situation mm. then, and you're, the pull, worst. you're pulling out the measuring tape then it's just the raised portion yeah um and yeah so it it's the we call it a tb test we call it a ppd uh it's the mantau tuberculosin tuberculos tuberculin skin test tst mm. uh, and what they're injecting in there is 0.1 milliliters of tuberculin purified protein derivative which is the ppd portion uh, right into the inner surface of the forearm. It's an intradermal injection. Uh, and even after you inject, you'll see the little raised, um, you know, section. And then it would uh, increase if, you know, you had latent or active TB. And you want to read it within 48 to 72 hours. If it's been the, the past the 72 hours, you'll probably want to restart. Uh, and like we were talking about with the bill, uh, there can be a false positive and false negative reactions. Um, just a couple of the reasons for a false positive might be um, if you're infected with another mycobacteria that's not tuberculosis related, um, or if somebody incorrectly administered it, that kind of thing, or used the incorrect bottle of antigen. Um, a false negative reaction, um, so it was negative, but you actually do have latent or active TB, could be if you had a recent TB infection within 8 to 10 weeks. So that's part of the reason for a two-step PPD situation. So if you were exposed and then had a PPD directly after, uh, they would catch it on the second round. Um, or if it's a really old TB infection, uh, or if you've had a recent live virus vaccination, like measles or smallpox. Uh, so if like this might be important if you're in the pharmacy setting and somebody had a, a um, TB test, you can get them on the same day as a live um, vaccine. But if you have had a live vaccine in the last four to six, or let's say in the last two weeks, you want to wait four to six weeks after the vaccine to do your PPD. Mm-hmm. And it's a false, it can give you a false, a false negative, false negative on yep. that one. Um, and what's uh, interesting about that is that was actually a question on the BCPS exam. No way. It was. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that I'll or say, not. Are you allowed to say I'm that? probably not. Nobody reported that. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a question. Good thing nobody listens to this podcast. Here's the thing, too, is I also... <laughs> Sometime, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. Oops. I was not on the board exam at all. Maybe we may do some editing this time. Nope, not editing. We we stick into our no editing policy. If I go I down know. in flames, y'all know why. When we were talking about I'm the taking Nap- my BCVS away for when sure. When we were talking about the Naplex the other day, I almost mentioned some things uh, similar to that and uh, thought better of it. Mm, oh, well. <laughs> Nobody report me to the board. Moving on. Okay. So uh, I guess start with latent. That's more of a easier treatment regimen. Sure. Um, so th- there's there's a few different options you can do. Um, one of them, probably the most common, would be isoniazid, um, 300 milligrams daily, um, or you can do 15 milligrams per kilogram um, twice weekly, uh, which is a max of 900 milligrams per single dose, and you do that for nine months. Yep. Um, so that's a lot of isoniazid. Yeah. That's preferred for patients, especially if they're HIV positive or pregnant or children it's in particular. That's a full pregnancy worth of isoniazid. That, it's exactly a full pregnancy <laughs> worth, if I do my math right. <laughs> so that's definitely um, probably a more common option. There's also, if some, especially if a patient cannot tolerate um, isoniazid or if they have, if you find out that the bug they have is resistant, um, you can do rifampin, 600 milligrams daily for four months, which to me, I'm like... Can I just have the rifampin? Yeah, but does it have worse side effects, you think? Probably. Liver-wise? I mean, they're all they like... They all have liver They're effect. all like, man, you better hang off the alcohol during this this treatment period because your liver's going to be in, in trouble. Great. Uh, yeah, I know. Man, better not get TB. <laughs> uh, but yeah, per- people with latent infections, so if you have a patient who's latent, uh, they probably won't feel sick, probably won't have symptoms, um, but that they are infected with... Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, but they don't actually have t- tuberculosis disease. So the active disease is what you would consider having tuberculosis. Um, the only sign is a positive reaction uh, to the tuberculin t- uh, skin test, or if you did a blood TB test, 
um, and they aren't infectious. So if it's latent, you can't actually spread the TB. It just means that you um, obtain that at some point in your travels or in your um, at U.S. escapades with to places where people had TB. Escapades. Yeah. Yeah. Stop having so many escapades. I know. Jeez, what's wrong with you? Treating patients and things. Yeah. Well, unless you're doing that, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll move on to active TB, and we'll talk about some like clinical pearls and things for each of these drugs in a second too. But um, active TB, the uh, easiest way to kind of remember is uh, the mnemonic, mnemonic or acronym, mnemonic, mnemonic. Yeah. Um, RIPE. So okay. R I P E. Um, that's kind of the the most common one. I checked in because uh, I, I originally saw that in like the RX Prep course book mm-hmm. and then i so i had to go back and look and make sure that wasn't something they made up before i set it on here <laughs> and it's with proprietary co- yeah proprietary. Great. no it's not it's a very very common uh, mnemonic but um so the ripe is basically r is rifampin i is isoniazid the p is pyrazinamide and then the e is thambitol mm-hmm. Um, and then you would do a, you're basically two different phases. Your intensive phase is going to be all four drugs mm-hmm. for two months or mm-hmm. eight weeks. Um, your continuation phase is going to be two of those drugs. So the isoniazid and then rifampin um, daily. Sometimes they'll do three times per week um, if the bug is definitely susceptible to both of those. And um, they'll do that for 18 weeks after. Yes. So another two months. So it's six months of total treatment. Um, I'm sorry, another four, four months. Four months. So I was going to say, wait a second. Two, two, <laughs> my math's not adding up. <laughs> wait a minute. So two months of initial treatment and then four months of those other two. Right. Um, there are some alternatives depending on the situation. Um, but once the tuberculosis isolate is known to be fully susceptible, um, you potentially could take a Thambutol off uh, in those first two months. Uh, but generally... If that's not, if you're not testing for that, then you would just go for those two months and then finish with the four. Um, an alternative to a thambutol could be streptomycin. Uh, these are all anti-tubercular agents, basically going to inhibit the replication of the bacteria and kill it. Even though some of the specific mechanisms are unknown for a couple of them. Yeah. Um, and directly observed therapy uh, is actually recommended for all patients, which I think is so interesting. And I wonder how often that happens. But basically. Um, like you might think of it with patients in um, in certain psychiatric hospitals where they watch them take their meds. They want to make sure that you're taking this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I guess if possible, that would be great. But I mean, it's not like, which I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about, you know, uh, quarantining and confining patients. But a lot of times, I guess they're ambulatory. So would you really be able to watch them take every medication? You better. <laughs> you better make sure they're doing it. So the I think you actually have to report. I I need I should have looked this. I bet up, you but do. I'm pretty yeah. sure you have to report this to DH if yeah. the person has um, you know, a active TB case, just yeah. like you would with syphilis or anything like that. So right. I'm almost positive about that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So you know, like you said, you can do. You, there's some drugs that you can kind of swap out instead of rifampin. Um, there's some other uh, like rifamycin, um, rifamycins in mm-hmm. the class. Um, the uh, rifampin is a very strong SIP inducer as well as P-glycoprotein. Um, and so especially with drugs like um, protease inhibitors, so if a person's HIV positive and they're on a protease inhibitor, probably should get them on a better drug. But um, <laughs> if they're on a protease inhibitor, um, then it's contraindicated. You can't use it because it'll um, induce the, the, medica- the metabolism and the drug's not going to be as effective. So, um, which is very important for tuberculosis because um, while this is a very old disease, it wasn't really all that common until um, the 80s. It started to pop back up, and it, uh, it's frequently associated with an HIV co-infection. So mm-hmm. that puts you at much higher risk of converting from latent to active is is having HIV. Yeah, because mm-hmm. the your natural immune system, for the most part, with tuberculosis, is able to take it and just wall it off. Um, and, and frequently that's in the lungs. And so when they, they'll do it, if, if you have an active uh, uh, PPD or a uh, positive PPD, they might do a chest x-ray to see if they can actually see it where y- your, um, your immune system is walled off the, the situation, the infection. Um, and that's kind of why it doesn't turn to latent, from latent to active. But if you have HIV, suppressed immune system, or other conditions that, where you would have a suppressed immune system, there's nothing stopping it, and it becomes uh, much more rampant. So I think that 
frequently if you're seeing an active tuberculosis patient in the U.S., um, they may also have HIV. Yeah. And, and also just a kind of a thing to keep an eye out for, especially for the pharmacist looking for this. Um, if a, we always think protease inhibitors, but, um, tenofovir, so disoprosyl fumarate has, if you do a drug interactions check, there's no interaction with rifampin. However, if you do that with the new version of tenofovir, the tenofovir alafenamide, which is what's taking over kind of a lot of our uh, combo products and whatnot, um, the tenofovir alafenamide will come up as an absolute contraindication. Um, Interesting. I, apparently, it's something to do with P glycoprotein, so it's not a SIP or anything like that, but it's specifically because tenofovir is available as a prodrug. So disoprosyl femur and TAF are both prodrugs of tenofovir, and so the, the prodrug specifically, the alafenamide, version, that is the one that's going to be interacting with rifampin. So if you have a patient and you, they're like, oh, you're good to go. I'm not on, you know, I'm on Bictarvi. You know, I'm not on a protease inhibitor. Uh, we still got to watch for the TAF interaction. Which is, you know, that's another goes back to the bill. Um, in a clinic, totally fine. In retail setting, you know, while you have the capability to be aware of that, it's not like you're prescribing their HIV medications. You can't make a switch mm-hmm. um, so that they can be on these uh, uh, tuberculosis medications or vice versa. Also, if you get a positive test, we can't follow up to see if it's latent or active. Uh, we can't do LFTs to make sure their liver can even handle the dosing. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it, but in a clinic setting, it's perfect because, um, you know, pharmacists can play an integral role in HIV treatment and can play an integral role in, um, other antiviral type treatments like hep C and then adding on, um, TB, you know, we'd be well equipped to, to be able to contribute in that situation. Yeah. Honestly, my my role is so important at the clinic. It's <laughs> <Just laughs> the most important. It's so important. I'm just kidding. They do just fine without me. <laughs> um, I don't even notice when I'm not yeah, there. I, I, don't I, even, do. I don't even show up on Wednesdays. They don't even know. Yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> um, if the person does have a, um, is on a protease inhibitor though, instead of rifampin, you can use um, rifa- uh, rifabutin is another um, rifamycin drug that you can use instead. Um, however, the interaction is still there with uh, tenofovir alafenamide because it still interacts with P-glycoprotein. Yep. So keep that in mind as well. So there are other um, drugs that you can substitute for rifampin, but it's usually rifampin or um, rifabutin is the other most common one. Yep. Uh, a couple other things about the drugs as far as side effects. So we keep referencing the liver. Um, isoniazid and rifampin are probably going to be the hardest on the liver. Um, uh, increased risk for hepatitis. Of course, any of these can cause like regular GI symptoms, regular CNS symptoms. Um, isoniazid, though, is known for peripheral neuropathy, uh, which can actually be easily managed with vitamin B6. Um, just give them 25 to 50 micrograms a day-ish, and they'll probably be all right. Um, like Mike said, rifampin is a, a strong three or four inducer and affects peak like a protein, um, can also have dermatologic reactions to it. So like rash and itching might be normal, uh, but you want to keep an eye on it. Uh, also some bone marrow suppression specifically with platelets. So you probably want to monitor a CBC, um, and they will probably have orange secretions. Um, so I, I think that relates to sweat and urine, right? And in tears, everything. In tears, so yeah. It's them. all the good stuff. So it can literally be, um you know, staining to your contacts if you're watching a very sad movie. <laughs> you cry during movies? I All the time. Mike is uh, full of tears. I'm, I'm extremely emotional <laughs> those, person. Those rom-coms just get them right at the end when... The what kind? The, the, rom, the rom-coms. What the heck is a rom-com? Mike loves a good rom-com. Romantic comedy. Oh, got yeah. it. I'm with you now. Okay. <laughs> you like, got what the me. heck is it? I thought I was thinking comic, like a <laughs> Comic-Con. Comic. I was like, I don't go to that. <laughs> I don't go to that. I'm a nerd, but not that kind of nerd. <laughs> Yeah, you're the cool kind of nerd. Yeah, super cool. Kind of nerd that works out and, and uh, wears backwards hats. I do wear backwards hats because I don't care. <laughs> it's my hat and I'm going to wear it <laughs> while we're recording on the VR. Yeah, but that's two of the, the big drugs. Um, Ethambutol has a uh, well-known side effect of optic, optic neuritis, specifically different, differentiating red and green. Um, so you'd want to follow up with eye exams if you're on Ethambutol. Um and yeah. But I mean, when would that ever, you know, when do you ever need to differentiate between those two? I know. <laughs> Christmas, yeah, Christmas time, it becomes a real big issue. Real huge issue. <laughs> I guess, you know, this maybe, is the most dri- depressing. maybe driving. This is the most depressed, yeah, driving. <laughs> <laughs> if you really, if you can't remember which, if it's top or bottom, when it means go. <laughs> right. That's a real. You, real get one of, you get one of those sideways ones like they have in, in uh, oh, Europe. Oh, no. You're totally screwed. You're done. Like, what do you do? 
Why are you driving in Europe? I know the middle is yellow, but what was was green on the right? That's why you wait for it to turn the middle and you go. You just go on the yellow. Yeah, you might get some honks. You wait for the honks, then you know you're supposed to be going. Uh huh. Yeah. Or you wait until you're t-boning somebody, and there you go. <laughs> and there's it's that. All over. There's that. But yeah, pure xenamide also uh, affects the liver, uh, can cause hepatitis, and can also increase uric acid. So uric your, acid's the big one for your gouty patients. Uh, be aware. Yep. If they're having a, a gout attack, probably not great to yeah start them right now. I want to get them some colchicine and go from there. Wait till after that's all done. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's the, the most common, you know, the, the ripe uh, treatment options. First line, um, you want to go through a couple of the second line options just yeah. to list a few? Let's hit them. So, second line options um, get a little bit more uh, obscure. Um, the first ones that you're going to be familiar with are the fluoroquinolones, so specifically Levo and Moxie. Um, those two seem to have uh, a lot better um outcomes as far as um, tuberculosis specifically com- then compared to like Cipro or anything. Um, so Levo and Moxie are your two go-tos if you had to use one of these. Um, and, uh, y- you know, again, definitely want to s- you use the first line options if possible. However, um, those are available if you need to um, add one in. And then they, they list on there as far as like kind of comorbidities to be aware of. Uh, Levofloxacin obviously has less um, is less frequently associated with QT interval prolongation than Moxie. So probably if the person has some sort of history of uh, arrhythmia or anything like that, low mag, then you'd want, probably want to go ahead and use a Levo instead of Moxie. Um, yep. there, there's another drug that um, I'm actually, I've never really even seen this or heard about this dispense, but um, beta quinoline um, is another one. Um, I looked up this cause I hadn't really looked at this drug in forever and, uh, forgot it even existed, but, um, it's actually got a black box warning for increased mortality. Oh, that's the best kind. That's the best kind of black box warning. <laughs> so yeah, then they compared it to placebo. They actually saw an increased risk of death. So, um, the, the hmm. big thing for that is you absolutely want to use this only in cases when other effective treatment is not approved. Pro- should also probably mention that they've done multiple trials looking at shorter treatment regimens and um, haven't been as effective th- as the standard six months. So right now that is the gold standard. Yeah. Um, and we mentioned streptomycin. That's an aminoglycoside. Amy Kaysen's also another kind of obscure option, both aminoglycosides. Speaking of those, I had, I had a patient um, who said they had a lot of allergies to stuff like all the antibiotics and things, and she was doing a gentamicin eye drop. Hmm. Um, I mean, I said it was fine. Do people commonly have allergies to aminoglycosides? I don't feel like they do. Mm, probably not. I don't know the statistics behind it, but I wouldn't think it's super common. Yeah, I guess she was okay. But anyways, I don't <laughs> anyway, really know. Anyway, she can't see anymore, so <laughs> that's not great. <laughs> but um, yeah, so th- there's several options that um, we I, we probably don't really need to go through all these because they're drugs you're most likely never going to see. But right. um, if you go on to up to date, there's a whole list of... Um, anti-tuberculosis tuber- drugs, like an overview, mm-hmm. uh, review of it, and um, they have a whole list of all the second-line agents you can go to. And resistant TB is becoming more of an issue, uh, especially as it becomes um, more common, unfortunately. Uh, so if you patients requiring retreatment should initially be treated with at least five drugs, including isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and then at least two, but maybe even three, uh, new drugs that they haven't uh, tried or been exposed to if it if it's considered resistant so that might pop up especially if you're like you know doctors without borders or you're popping over to other countries you might mm-hmm. see this kind of thing never know never know what else anything else we want we should go over with this that was the big stuff i had some stats here um you know how I like my stats. I do. You do love your stats. I do love my stats. But uh, so World Health Organization estimated that 2 billion people have latent TB uh, and that globally in 2009, man, that was 10 years ago, 2009. Wait, wait a minute. It carried the one. Yeah. yeah uh-huh. 10 years yeah. ago. Good math. Uh, uh, it killed 1.7 million people. So Jeez. Um, that's a good bit. It's actually... I think I saw something. Yeah, it's considered uh, the most common cause of infectious disease-related mortality worldwide. Yeah, why haven't we done this one sooner? I don't know. What are yeah. we thinking? I think it's just because we're we're spoiled in the U.S. and we we get the PPD tests, but yeah. it's pretty unusual for somebody to actually have latent, much less active TB. But around the world, it's uh, it's uh, pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. So. Um 
there are other mycobacterium infections as well. Just mm-hmm. kind of keep in, in mind. Um, so things like uh, there's mycobacterium marinum, um, which is a type of mycobacterium that we see in people who uh, they call it fish tuberculosis. Um, so it's pa- it's patients that um, basically like fishermen will get hooks. Uh, I actually knew a guy who got a hook. He was deep sea fishing, got a hook stuck in his hand, and um, all of a sudden he developed this really bad infection on his on his hand. And it was mycobacterium marinum that really? actually caused it. Only so, in Charleston. I know, right? But, um, or any other coastal town. Or any other place where they have fishing. <laughs> um, but people who have like saltwater fish tanks, there's a, there's other oh, yeah. options for it as well that huh. you can get it. But um, it's kind of the same drug class as far as the rifampin and thambital, um, but they also add on um, a macrolide as well, usually clorithromycin or azithromycin. Um, but uh, that's another one that you can see. Um, Mycobacterium leprae is... Uh, Leprosy, if I remember. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like leprosy. <laughs> um, so that's another one that you can, you know, keep keep in mind as far as mycobacterium causing. Um, and then there's uh, like avium complex, so MAC. Mm-hmm. You know, we see that, in, especially in patients with really low CD4 counts that have mm-hmm. HIV. It's one of those opportunistic infections. Yeah. So, um, you know, someone who has active MAC, you're also going to be thinking rifampin and thambutol, as well as a macrolide. So some of the same drugs will pop up for mycobacterium. Right. These are very specific agents. And like um, I mentioned before, that's one of the things that can cause a false positive for right. TB. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I personally like, you know, if you're looking for a good resource, I like the Johns Hopkins, the antibiotic guide that has a really good, uh, um, you know, breakdown of all the different types of mycobacterium infections. You can just go to pathogens type in mycobacterium and it lists all of them out and you can click each one and, and to look up that do you look up johns hopkins antibiotic by to download the app because it's not like it's under uh, the app itself is called U central yeah, and yeah. it's it's the johns hopkins um antibiotic and hiv guide kind of all rolled into one it's got a bunch of calculators on there and journals and it's it's really good yeah it's handy so um i'm blessed to have MUSC provided to me at no charge <laughs> <laughs> so um i don't i don't know how expensive it is but uh you know I think I have it for free, unless I just haven't gotten on there in a while since I lost the access. But I thought mm. that you could just get on there. You probably can. Maybe not. I don't know. I'll look. Come on, Johns Hopkins. Just give it Help out to all out. us. Help us out. There are, Help us out. Shout out to our main sponsor, Johns Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine? They'd be like, uh, no. We've had like three guys on here who were previous Johns Hopkins interns. Did we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Brian. We had, we had, we had Brian. We had um, John, Tyrell. John Tyrell. And then mm. we had um, Cancer Guy. Not that he has cancer, but he treats cancer. Oh, yeah. Uh, was he John Hopkins? I thought he was... Uh, yeah, they were all there at the same time. He, oh, was he? I could have swore. Uh, you don't want Jordan. Yeah, Jordan. I, I was thinking he... Uh, I knew Cleveland Clinic. I didn't know he oh, was John Hopkins. Maybe it was Cleveland. I, that was I, a while I thought I, I thought when we had John on, I was like, this is like our third John Hopkins guy. Maybe not. We just know so many super important it's Really people. important people. Or people who just pick good rotations. Yeah, basically. So. But, uh, yeah. So... Um, that's uh that's all we got for you on the that's tb guys that's tb another one of our i think the last um the kind of overview we did like this was parkinson's so this is good i like these these yeah, are fun absolutely. i learn i learn and i remember there you go but um cool uh i guess we will figure out what we're gonna talk about next time and get back with you guys <laughs> we will <laughs> now thank you guys so much for listening and um you know really really appreciate the uh support we've gotten a lot of uh solid ratings on on itunes and uh you know we appreciate all of those that really helps us out a lot um you know the one the one star rating hurt our feelings but we're over it <laughs> mike talks about it every time <laughs> it's hilarious i was like who oh, they somebody hated us that much they had to give well, one star he's got sucked <laughs> but um no, don't pretty- forget to subscribe that way the podcast just automatically download and you got it right there yeah just click it's and gonna play. change your life it will <laughs> <laughs> since you're already listening you're probably you know that's not true <laughs> <laughs> we can't lie to you guys but uh yeah thank you guys so much for the support please let us know if you have any questions concerns comments ways we can improve um we will uh, have this episode mostly in VR. My VR camera actually just went off, just went and off. Uh, so it's not going to get the ending. Awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, make sure you guys check that out on YouTube. It's kind of cool. If you want to sit in the room with us, you can kind of look around and uh, hang out with us while we're talking. And uh, other than that, we will see you guys next time. Take it easy. <laughs>